You're good. All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome back for day two of our three-day public hearing regarding the core Section 404 permit for the PolyMet North Met Mine Project near Babbitt, Minnesota. Again, my name is Colonel Carl Jansen. I serve as the commander of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers St. Paul District, and I thank all parties for joining us again today to provide statements. Our schedule for today is as follows. First, we'll hear PolyMet's views, opinions, and recommendations, and they have a two-hour allocation for this purpose. Following PolyMet's presentation, we'll recess for lunch until 1230. After lunch, Fond du Lac is allocated a two-hour rebuttal opportunity. Following their rebuttal, we'll take a recess, and then PolyMet will have a two-hour rebuttal opportunity as well. Following the rebuttals, I'll review instructions for tomorrow's uh, public hearing, and then we'll adjourn for the day. So with that, I'd like to recognize Ms. Christy Kearney. Thank you, Colonel, for having us today. My name is Christy Kearney. Kearney is K-E-A-R-N-E-Y. I'm the Vice President of Environmental Affairs for PolyMet Mining. I've been with PolyMet for six years now. I joined the team just before we started environmental permitting, um, although I was a consultant for PolyMet for 10 years prior to that uh, throughout the environmental, permit environmental review process. I'm my background is I'm a licensed professional environmental engineer. I've been doing environmental review and permitting for close to 25 years throughout the Midwest and in Alaska. I'm originally from Hibbing, Minnesota, which is where I live right now, uh, with my husband and my daughter. I'm an av avid outdoors woman. I hunt, I fish, I play in northeastern Minnesota. Most of our team live right around the mine and the plant site, and it's important to all of us that we protect the natural resources around us. Yesterday, you heard close to eight hours of testimony from the band and the band's experts that will violate the band's water quality standards. This is in direct conflict with our um, final EIS and our environmental permits. There are, th there are two main reasons that we will not be violating the, the band's water quality standards. First and foremost is we're cleaning up a legacy brownfield plant site with legacy water quality issues, which in turn will also clean up the St. Louis River. And second, we're 116 river miles upstream from the Fond du Lac Reservation. The water from our discharges is about 0.5% of the flow at Fond du Lac. This is a picture of our plant site, our legacy um, plant site. Uh, this is the concentrator at the plant. So this was built in the mid-1950s. Our tailings basin is shown here in the background. The large green field-looking area and the pond on the, on the right. Today I'm going to start with an overview of our project, explaining a little bit about our project, our project's location, where we are in relation to the Fond du Lac Reservation, which you also heard about yesterday, and characterize our discharge relative to the St. Louis River flows. First, let's talk about why we're all here and why this all matters. Our project will mine and process key metals such as copper, nickel, and cobalt, which are essential for the clean energy transition. If we assume all of our metals go to electric vehicles, our 20-year mine plan has enough copper to supply 6.7 million ele electric vehicles enough nickel to supply 2.6 million electric vehicles, and enough cobalt to supply close to 690,000 electric vehicles. By replacing this number of gas-powered ve passenger vehicles, we'll be offsetting more than 30 million metric tons of CO2 with copper alone. If our metals went to wind turbines instead, 
we'll have enough copper for approximately 130,000 wind turbines. This statement by the World Bank Association, an international policy and financing or organization, is stunning. In the last 5,000 years, about 550 million tons of copper has been produced. The world will need the same amount of copper in the next 25 years to meet the global demand. And this demand is driven by cl the clean energy movement and renewable energy. The Biden administration is focused on this, the transition to electric vehicles and renewable energy and has taken many steps over the last year to strengthen and boost the domestic supply chains of critical metals needed. In June 2021, last year, the White, this White House report shown on the left came out as a result of an executive order requesting review of America's supply chains. The PolyMet project was specifically cited on page 99 of this report as a fully permitted domestic nickel mine. At the end of March, about a month ago, President Biden invoked the Defense Production Act meant to encourage and help responsibly develop projects such as the North Met project move forward. Now let's look at where PolyMet is located in northeastern Minnesota. <clears throat> this figure outlines the St. Louis River watershed, as you've seen yesterday. The stars here show the location of the plant site and mine site at the upper part of the watershed, on the eastern side of the Masabi Iron Range, where mining has occurred for over 130 years. Lake Superior is shown at the bottom of the watershed, near Fond du Lac's reservation. There's a few important points here. Our North Met project is located at the very top of the watershed, very close to the headwaters of the St. Louis River. You can see the magnitude of the watershed above Fond du Lac's reservation, with nearly 85% of the watershed coming in above Fond du Lac, and the last ma major watershed, the Cloquet River, coming in between Fond du Lac's borders. Our nearest discharge point is 116 river miles, from Fond du Lac's reservation. That's from the northernmost part of Fond du Lac's reservation to our closest discharge point at, at PolyMet. Just to put into context how far Fond du Lac is from the PolyMet project, we have some comparisons shown here. It's 150 road miles from Duluth to St. Paul, 120 road miles from LA to San Diego, 116 river miles from PolyMet to Fond du Lac, as I mentioned. 124 miles gets you halfway to the International Space Station. The Corps of Engineers headquarters is 130 miles from Black Bear Casino. It's a long way. Now we want to call your attention to two specific evaluation locations that we use to, to bookend potential impacts to Fond du Lac as part of our permitting process. These locations have been used by the DNR and the MPCA in their mercury evaluation reports over the years, which is why they were chosen for our project. There's a lot of pu published literature on mercury specifically from these, both of these locations. PolyMet and the MPCA reference these two evaluation locations throughout our permit documents including the 401 Water Quality Certification Fact Sheet and the NPDES Permit Fact Sheet. This includes the Forbes USGS site, which is 50 miles downstream from PolyMet and 60, 66 miles upstream from Fond du Lac, and the Cloquet River, which is 143 miles downstream from PolyMet and just five miles downstream from Fond du Lac. Now to zoom into these two locations, these two aerial photos are set at the same scale, showing the size of the St. Louis River at these two evaluation locations. The average flow at Forbes is 570 CFS. The average flow at Cloquet, it's actually Scanlon, just immediately south of Cloquet, is 2300 CFS, four times the flow. This graphic is intended to, to provide some context to the river flows that we're evaluating. The figure is intended to be to scale relative to the flows of the river. To orient you, 
The, the, our northern streams are shown to the left, with the Partridge River, the St. Louis River headquarters, and the Embarrass River shown here. Fond du Lac is shown to the right, with the Cloquet River coming in between its borders. Now to add the mine site and plant site flows. These flows couldn't be shown to scale or you wouldn't see them on the figure. So these are the flows that come from our mine site and plant site. We have four CFS coming off of the mine site. This is water that's unimpacted by mine, mining activities. So it's stormwater and natural runoff. From the plant site, we have approximately eight CFS of flow. One CFS going to the Partridge River and seven CFS going to the Embarrass River. This is water mainly coming from our wastewater treatment system discharge, so treated wastewater and some stormwater. We have evaluation locations just downstream of both our plant site and mine site. Our flows at the mine site are captured in the Partridge River at this location shown here with about 49 CFS of flow. And downstream of the Embarrass, in the Embarrass River is about 87 CFS of flow. As I mentioned earlier, Forbes is 570 CFS of flow. And the Cloquet, at, at, at Cloquet, we have about 2,300 CFS of flow. To put into context the size of our flows, we have some graphics shown here. Our flow at the mine site is about 10% of the flow at, in the Partridge River. Our flow in the Embarrass River is about 8% of the flow in the Embarrass River. At Forbes, our discharges from the mine site and plant site represent 2% of the flow of the river there. And just downstream of Fond du Lac, our mine site and plant site flows represents about a half a percent of the flow in the river in that location. Now turning back to the plant site, you saw this figure before, our brown, brownfield plant site. We're going to talk a little bit about our existing conditions that are in place today before the North Met project comes online. As I mentioned earlier, we, have, we are using a legacy um, taconite mine that has water quality issues on site. Zooming out to an overview of the site, our plant site is shown here. We have streams to the north that are fed from the seeps that are currently coming out of our tailings basin. We have a seep, seeps to the south feeding Second Creek downstream of the plant site. To the east, we have our mine site, which is mostly a, which is a green field, with the Partridge River running to the north, to the east, and to the south of it. We're immediately south of the North Shore Mine, Peter Mitchell Mine. We have a transportation utility corridor between the mine site and plant site with an existing haul road, an existing railroad, and power lines between that we'll be reusing for our project site. And then the last thing I want to point out is Colby Lake, which is just south of the plant site. This is a makeup water source for the plant site, so when we need additional water to run our plant, we have an appropriation permit to take water from Colby Lake. This is significant because Colby Lake water, Colby Lake is high in mercury as well. This is an aerial photo zoomed back out to the plant site and the tailings basin. So we're reusing a former taconite tailings basin to hold our, our tailings as well as the plant site, which you can see here on the south side of the tailings basin. This large building, which was shown in, in prior um, photos, is about a quarter mile long for context. The tailings basin is very large. It's about four and a half square miles. The tailings basin holds a, just over 800 million cubic yards of taconite tailings which is the cause of the legacy water quality problems that we see downstream and around our site. This site has been closed for over 20 years. It closed in January of 2021. However, the tailings basin is covered under a consent decree and an NPDES permit. It's the source of several elevated constituents to downstream waters, including sulfate, which ranges, ranges from 200 to 300 milligrams per liter, and specific conductance, which ranges from 900 to 2,600 microsiemens per centimeter, that's currently flowing downstream. 
The Polymets North Met project design accounts for these legacy water quality issues at this brownfield site. It's the water management that we're planning for our project that the band omits from their will effect letter and from their descriptions of our project site. In addition to the water collection and reuse, we'll be using best available technology for water treatment for our project site, membrane treatment technology. So you'll recall this figure showing our mine site and plant site. Zooming over to the mine site, I want to walk you through our project. This figure reflects our maximum build out, approximately mine year 11. The gray polygons here are our mine pits. The yellow polygons are our stockpiles. We have our hull roads shown here in black cross hatch and our overburdened storage laid and lay down area where we're storing peat for future reuse and reclamation um, shown here. The, the pink polygons are what I want to call your attention to. These pink polygons are our mine water ponds. We'll be collecting mine water that's impacted from runoff from our stockpiles, our haul roads, our pits, and our overburdened storage and laydown area. This water will be pumped down to our equalization basin south of the mine site and pumped over to the plant site for treatment and reuse at the plant site. Separate, separate from our mine water management, we have stormwater management. This is the natural runoff in stormwater that's unimpacted by mining activities. The yellow dashed lines are stormwater ditches that route stormwater around and away from our mine features. These lead to our blue stormwater ponds. The blue ponds are retention ponds that allow stormwater to slow and settle any suspended solids from the runoff and stormwater before leaving the site. Our mine water management actions, collecting water that's been contacted by mine water, are estimated to reduce flows on the mine site by about 48%. This sounds significant, but we're just talking about this immediate area. The 48% reduction of flows from collection of our water off our mine features is estimated to result in less than a 5% change in the Partridge River just south of our project site. We're required by our permit conditions to maintain plus or minus 20% of the flows in the Partridge River. Regardless, the mine impacted water capture system is what provides us with a reduction of sulfate and mercury from the mine site. Now to move over to the plant site and tailings basin. We'll use the eastern half of the existing tailings basin for storage of our tailings on the project. This figure is a representation of mine year 20 with full build out at the end of our project and a pond at the top of our tailings basin. The plant site is shown to the south of the tailings basin with stormwater ponds that are fairly small and maybe hard to see, but they're blue, similar to what you saw at our mine site. And then we have our hydrometallurgical residue facility, which is a double line separate system. The important mine water feature I want to call your attention to here is this light blue and dark blue dash line around the tailings basin. This is our seepage containment system. It isn't shown in areas where there's high bedrock, where there would be no seepage, but it is surrounding our, our tailings basin. You'll also see arrows coming out from that system. They actually continue along the, the east side as well. This represents our stream augmentation system. Because we're collecting the seepage that's currently feeding streams to the north and to the south of our tailings basin, we're required by our permits to augment the streams on the outside of our containment system with treated water from our wastewater treatment system. We're required to, to augment these streams at a rate of plus or minus 20%, mimicking nat nat natural conditions in the, in the streams. This figure shows that containment wall in cross section. Seepage flows through and down through and out of our tailings basin into the surficial aquifer. This is happening now with that water flowing off site and into the downstream waters. And ultimately to the St. Louis River. Prior to discharge of any tailings into our tailings basin, 
we'll be installing a cutoff wall tied into bedrock to stop further seepage from leaving the tailings basin. Nancy mentioned in her, in her presentation yesterday that she's seen these cutoff walls only 50 to 60% effective. Cutoff walls have been used for decades around the world in landfills, in um, remediation sites, and in dams by the Corps of Engineers. That seepage stopped from our cutoff wall will be collected in a series of pump pipes and pumps that will be pumped back up to the tailings basin for, for future for reuse, as well as to our water treatment system to clean up and discharge. The wastewater treatment system will, the augmentation system will be fed by the water treatment system, discharged downstream of that cutoff wall system. Polymet's water management system and, and treatment system is critical to understand, to really understand the protections that are in place for the downstream waters. It's these water management actions that weren't mentioned by the band yesterday or in their will effect letter. Just to walk through them again, Polymet will collect and treat tailings basin seepage with this containment system. We'll also be collecting and treating mine water impact, mine impacted waters from the mine site. We'll be using water from Colby Lake for plant makeup. Colby Lake being high in mercury, we'll remove that that um, load from the St. Louis River system for use in our plant site and treatment before discharge. These actions will reduce mercury loading, specific conductance, and sulfate loading in the St. Louis River watershed. Sulfate loading will be reduced by 1,380,000 kilograms per year, totaling just under 28 billion kilograms over the 20-year life of the mine. Critical to this reduction is our use of best available technology for treatment of sulfate and other constituents. We're using membrane treatment technology. This water treatment design is tried a tried and true method used for drinking water around the world and in many mine applications. This technology is actually also used in Michigan over at the Eagle Mine to meet their mercury standard of 1.3 nanograms per liter. Eagle's last permit fact sheet from 2015 states they're required to use a detection limit of 0.5 nanograms per liter of, sulf of mercury, and they've been measuring non-detects in their discharge, so something less than 0.5 nanograms per liter. We've tested our wastewater treatment system in a pilot plant shown here that ran over 3 million gallons through, successfully meeting that 10 milligram per liter sulfate standard. This is proven technology. The North Met project is the only project permitted to meet the sulfate limit of 10 milligram per liter at the end of the pipe. This was just confirmed with the MPCA last week. The water quality standard is actually at the wild rice stand and the nearest stand from our discharge is 10 mi miles downstream. We agreed to meet this 10 milligram per liter wild rice standard at the end of our pipe during our environmental review process. For comparison, the federal drinking water standard is 250 milligrams per liter. This slide provides some context to the mercury story. Rain is falling on our site at about 11 to 12 nanograms per liter. Runoff in the watershed around our site is three and a half to six nanograms per liter. Our permits require us to discharge water at something less than the 1.3 nanogram per liter standard. This is nine times cleaner than rainwater. It's three times cleaner than what's found in the natural watershed. From a simple mass balance perspective, this is, this is easy math. Polymet's treating runoff from three and a half to six nanograms per liter from 4,800 acres down to something less than 1.3 nanograms per liter. We're removing a lot of mercury. Let's go back to our graphic with these flows.
You've seen these numbers already. Our mine water management actions at the mine site will result in a reduction of 4.4 grams per year of mercury from the mine site. So capture of the 48% of the, of the flows at the mine site, which is mostly rainwater, will reduce mercury in the Partridge River by 4.4 grams per year. Our mine water actions at the plant site reduces mercury by 0.8 grams per year in the Embarrass River. At Forbes, this equates to a reduction of 5.2 grams per year of mercury from the St. Louis River, which is carried down to Cloquet and to the Fond du Lac Reservation. The story is similar but more astounding for sulfate. By collection of rainwater at the mine site, our mine-impacted waters we're reducing sulfate by 100,000 kilograms. Thank you. At the plant site, um, our seepage containment system, which is currently capturing that seepage water that's ranging from 200 to 300 milligrams per liter, and we're discharging water at 10 milligrams per liter, results in a significant reduction of sulfate. 1,280,000 kilograms per year. Add these together and you get a reduction of about 1.4 million kilograms per, per year at Forbes, which continues down to Cloquet. Over the 20 year life of our project, this results in a little over 100 grams of mercury being removed from the St. Louis River. And close to 28 billion kilograms of sulfate being removed from the system, all as a result of a brownfield cleanup. It's these reductions that allowed the MPCA to issue the 401 certification. So in summary, our project's water management strategy improves water quality in the St. Louis River. The project's water management actions are designed to remove mercury and sulfate and specific conductance. Most mercury load comes from rainwater, which we're collecting and treating. Our wastewater treatment system is best available technology, membrane treatment, to meet that sulfate standard. And the overall design of our project results in reductions of mercury and sulfate loads and specific conductance concentrations in the St. Louis River. Now to look at the band's claims. Their four main claims in violation of water quality are related to sulfate, mercury, methylmercury, and specific conductance. In making those claims, the band ignores the project's water management actions. They weren't even mentioned yesterday. They also assert a number of other violations in their will effect letter, including anti-degradation, narrative standards, designated uses, and wetland water quality. But they're all based on a claim that we will significantly increase sulfate, mercury, methylmercury, and specific conductance enough to violate those other water quality standards. We will now have our expert witnesses come up and talk through the band's claims to show that not only will we not increase the concentrations of any of these parameters, but we will reduce the loads of mercury and sulfate and the concentration of specific conductance in the St. Louis River waters, including at Fond du Lac's reservation. As a preview, we'll have three main, three different technical experts come up to present the science as it pertains to the band's claims. Steve Donahue from Foth will come up first, who will show how the primary source of mercury to the watershed is from precipitation. He will present the results of a new analysis showing that the project will not cause a measurable change to specific conductance or salinity. Fond du Lac specific conductance water quality standard of 300 microsiemens per centimeter was not in effect when our project was permitted, so this is a new analysis. He will also explain the relationship between sulfate, mercury, and methylmercury, which you also heard yesterday. Cliff Tworski from Bar Engineering is our mercury expert that led our cross-media analysis and permitting 
and the Mercury work in our EIS process. Cliff will summarize the detailed water modeling work that shows the project will decrease the loading of sulfate mercury and methyl mercury in the St. Louis River. And lastly, we'll have Greg Council from Tetratech, who will explain how the band's assertions of indirect wetland impacts are significantly overstated, explain why the methods they state should have been used are not actually appropriate, and how the processes they state will cause concern will cause concerns actually result in less methylmercury reaching the St. Louis River. Uh, good morning, Colonel Jansen and uh, participants in this hearing. My name is uh, Steve Donahue, last name spelled D-O-N-O-H-U-E. I work at Foth Infrastructure and Environment, and I am the Vice President of Mining Sector Services. I have, by way of background, about 32 years of experience working in the mining industry, principally on the permitting of new metallic mining projects, including the Eagle project that uh, Christy Kearney referenced uh, previously. I'm also a licensed professional hydrologist, so my technical expertise is in the area of water resources, hydrology, and hydrogeology. I'm going to focus today on four key points that we actually addressed in technical memoranda that have been provided to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, first, we're going to focus on mercury loading to the St. Louis River and provide information to the hearing here showing how that is driven by atmospheric processes, principally uh, precipitation that deposits mercury into the entirety of the St. Louis River watershed. And also the same type of process occurs with sulfate. That is the driver behind the behavior that we see in the St. Louis River related to mercury as it relates to the Fond du Lac Reservation in the St. Louis River as it flows, flows by and adjacent to that reservation. Secondly, we're going to focus on another memoranda that we provided, which is the band's claim that specific conductance uh, will be violated in the waters of the, uh, of the band. Uh, the analysis that we provided in the memorandum uh, looks at the various types of discharges that are going to take place, the various types of water management activities that are going to take place on the project that are going to pull out things like sulfate and other constituents and show how that reduces actually specific conductance in the St. Louis River and also reduces salinity in the St. Louis River, which is another issue that has been raised by the band. Finally, uh, I will focus on uh, water level fluctuations, the inputs of sulfate and mercury via these atmospheric processes into the wetlands and the types of behavior that occurs in these wetlands that drives the generation of methylmercury, which as we heard from Dr. Branfearn yesterday, is the form of mercury that people are concerned about as it relates to migration through these water resources. So to begin with, we're going to start at a fairly high level here. And what we have here is we're looking at mercury loadings via precipitation upstream of the Fond du Lac Reservation boundary. Uh, this is based off of data that is referenced in this footnote here on the, on the figure, uh, where we've looked at data on what is the mercury concentration in precipitation in this area. And on average, it averages about uh, 11.7 nanograms per liter in precipitation over the last 20 years. If we apply that precip, uh, which is about 29.8 inches per year, at 11.7 nanograms uh, in that precip water to these various watersheds, sub-watersheds that drain into the St. Louis River, and we've identified all these sub-watersheds along the bottom of the graph here, we can see that some of these sub-watersheds are catching significant amounts of mercury just due to precipitation alone. That is what some of that mercury, although it all doesn't run off into the 
streams that feed the St. Louis River watershed. It is the driver behind the mercury that ends up there. It is the driver behind the mercury that ends up in the wetlands where some of it is converted to methylmercury, which then makes its way into the river that flows by the reservation. The least significant source of natural mercury input into this watershed is the subwatershed around the North Met project. This figure alone demonstrates that the behavior of mercury in the St. Louis River near the reservation is really driven by these other watersheds and what's occurring there naturally via precipitation. As Christy Kearney mentioned, once the project goes into operation, water management is key to the behavior of mercury as it relates to the PolyMet project. With that capture system around the uh, flotation, the uh, tailings basin, with the containment of water at the mine site, the pumping of that water through the water treatment system, we will actually see a reduction in mercury loading in the subwatershed around the project by about 5.2 nanograms per liter. It's all driven by the engineering and the treatment of water at the mine operation. Another way of looking at this is on this flow diagram that Christy provided earlier. Here we've got all the different uh, tributaries flowing into the St. Louis River. Got the mine site tributary and the plant site tributaries, which are pretty minor, flowing into the Partridge River and the Embarrass River, which feed the St. Louis River. We're looking at that same data that we had on the previous figure. And this is, if we look at the upper part of the Partridge River, this is the amount of mercury that's coming into that watershed vis-a-vis -vis precipitation on an annual basis. Same thing in the Embarrass River. We've got about 4,183 grams per year that's impinging on that watershed on an annual basis. A portion of that ends up in the river that then drains into the St. Louis River. Likewise, as we go downstream and we see larger watersheds feeding the St. Louis River, that loading of mercury, and as a result, methylmercury that goes into the river uh, increases. Such that by the time we get to the uh, upstream boundary of the reservation, there's about 56,000 grams per year of mercury that is naturally coming into the system in this watershed, some of which, which makes its way into the St. Louis River and drives the mercury behavior that we see in the St. Louis River. Another way of looking at it is vis-a-vis -vis this pie chart. We're looking at the same type of data and we can see that the North Met project under existing conditions is an insignificant contributor to the amount of mercury loading that takes place in this watershed on an annual basis. Again, once the project goes into operation, the amount of mercury coming from the small watershed around the PolyMet project, which is already a small contributor to this watershed, is actually going to be reduced Again, it's due to the containment of water, the capture of that water, and the treatment of that water through the membrane filtration technology that's built into the water treatment system. As Christy mentioned, we know that this technology works. It's not speculative. It's been used at other mine sites, notably the Eagle Mine site. And just by way of background, there were a lot of claims made at that project 10 years ago that the technology wouldn't work. It has worked. It's in operation and it's working uh, today. Here we're looking at the same data with the project in operation and again about a 5.2 gram of mercury per year reduction that's going to go into the St. Louis River from the PolyMet project. That results into a, in, in 104 grams reduction in mercury loading to the St. Louis River over the 20-year life of the mine. Now, a 5.2 gram per year or 104 grams uh, removed over the 20-year mine life 
may not sound like a whole lot of mercury, but when we're talking nanograms per liter, which is a billion times less than a gram, this is a pretty significant reduction uh, in mercury loading to the St. Louis River due to the cleanup of the brownfield site at this project. We're now going to look at sulfate. As Dr. Brandfearn mentioned yesterday, uh, sulfate is also one of the constituents that drives methylmercury behavior, which is what everybody's concerned about when we talk about mercury. And it's basically the same story. Sulfate comes in via atmospheric precipitation into the watershed. Some of that makes its way into the wetland systems, into the uh, river, and that's what drives the methylation behavior that we see in these wetland systems, uh, creating the more mobile form of uh, uh, mercury uh, that uh, people are concerned about. So same type of data, we're looking at uh, sulfate loading to these various watersheds. In the upper Partridge River, we've got 149 tons per year of sulfate that naturally comes onto the landscape for, from precipitation. The Embarrass River, 179 tons per year. West Two River, Mudhead Creek, Sand Creek, and the headwaters to the St. Louis River, 719 tons of sulfate is deposited on the landscape into some of the wetlands. That's what makes its way into the uh, uh, water resources in this system and uh, drives the behavior of methylmercury. 740 tons at West Swan River, Flood River, Artichoke River, East Savannah River, and another 576 tons per year are coming into the system uh, from Whiteface River and the Flood River. So in total, there's about 2,400 tons per year of sulfate uh, that is deposited on this watershed upstream of the uh, Fond du Lac Reservation. When the project goes into operation, again, we're going to be collecting water at the Tailings Basin through the seepage collection system. All of what I refer to as the contact water at the mine site, that's the water coming out of the mine, the water coming off of the haul roads, et cetera. Anything that's going to be carrying sulfate or constituents of concern, all of that water is routed to the water treatment system and it's treated to very low concentrations, below 1.3 nanograms per liter mercury to 10 milligrams per liter of sulfate before that water is returned to the environment. So we're pulling, if you will, constituents out of the system and returning cleaner water back to the environment. That results in is a net effect from the operation where there's going to be 1,380,000 kilograms of sulfate that are pulled out of this system every year due to the water management strategy. It's a significant reduction over the life of the project. That is 27.6 billion kilograms of sulfate that are going to be pulled out of the system due to the operation of the water management, the water treatment features at this project. I next like to uh, turn our attention to specific conductance and salinity. Uh, start out by saying that the project, we did uh, provide a memorandum looking specifically at specific conductance. And that memorandum that we provided to the Corps shows that the project will comply with the band's water quality standard for specific conductance. The project will cause a reduction in specific conductance in the St. Louis River. The project will also cause a reduction in salinity in the St. Louis River at Forbes. We looked at Forbes because Forbes uh, is the uh, is the furthest upstream spawning area for uh, for sturgeon. So the bands have established water quality standards of 300 micro siemens per centimeter. Uh, just to uh, clarify, specific conductance refers to the ability of water to conduct electricity. It's based on um, dissolved anions and cations in the in in the water, cations like uh, mag, uh, magnesium, calcium, and anions like sulfate and chloride and things like that. That's what drives the ability of the water to conduct. 
So the baseline in the St. Louis River near Cloquet is about 189 micro siemens per centimeter. At peak project operation, uh, the analysis that we provided to the Corps in our memorandum shows that there will be a 0 0.4 to 0 point, 0 0.66 micro siemens uh, per centimeter reduction in specific conductance in the St. Louis River. This again is due to the fact that we're collecting water coming out of the seepage, seepage water coming out of the tailings basin that's high in sulfate, high in specific conductance, that's going through a membrane filtration system to remove that load of anions and cations in that water. That's going to reduce the uh, um, uh, specific conductance in the water when that water is returned back to the environment. Likewise, if we're going to reduce specific conductance in the water, we will also reduce salinity. The band has noted that a salinity of 23,000 or 23 parts per thousand will impede uh, sturgeon spawning. We looked at the incremental effect on salinity from the project, and there will actually be a reduction in salinity in the St. Louis River at Forbes of between 0 .0007 and 0 0.0012 parts per thousand. There will be no impact on spawning of sturgeon due to the operation of this project. <clears throat> Next topic is methylmercury. Uh, first, it's noted that meth mercury methylation will be inhibited by a reduction in sulfate loading from the project. We're pulling a significant amount of sulfate out of the system, that sulfate that's naturally making its way into the, the environment today, by pulling that sulfate out of the headwaters that drain into the Embarrass River and the Partridge River, uh, that will reduce the sulfate loading further downstream and will reduce methyl, uh, uh, methyl mercury formation. Well, we're also going to talk about nat natural seasonal fluctuations in water levels in these peatland environments as they are the primary driver for mercury methylation, uh, not drawdown. We're going to get into this a little later with some of the uh, uh, subsequent speakers here. First of all, we note that reduction in sulfate loading from the water treatment system will inhibit methyl mercury uh, formation. The band's allegations of increased mercury methylation are predicated on an increase in sulfate loading. There will be no increase in sulfate loading at the project because all that water is going to be pulled out and treated. As noted previously, project-related activities will reduce sulfate loading to the St. Louis River by 1,380,000 kilograms per year over the life of the project, that's 27.6 billion kilograms removed from the system. Let's look at the effects of precipitation, which brings in mercury, brings in sulfate. Let's look at the effects of precipitation on sulfide oxidation, methylation of mercury, kind of the natural cycle that generates this. So here we have a cross-section schematic of a peat wetland We've got a shallow water table that's maybe 18 inches, 20 inches below the land surface. We've got uh, roughly unsaturated, partially saturated peat environment above that. Precipitation impinges on the wetland, and that precipitation, as we discussed earlier, brings in sulfate from the precip and mercury. That sulfate and mercury is then dissolved or available in the pore water of that uh, peat environment. There's also soil dust that is deposited on the landscape in these peat environments, and that soil dust can have sulfide mineralization, sulfide particles. In this upper unsaturated portion of the wetland, those sulfide particles can oxidize, and when they oxidize from sulfide, they go to sulfate, which is soluble in the water, makes its way as a source of sulfate loading into this peat environment. 
Over time, those particles settle through the peat environment down below the water table. Once they're below the water table, their source of oxygen is cut off and that oxidation no longer occurs. So there's, they're no longer a source of sulfate uh, to the system. As the water table fluctuates and they fluctu the water levels in these wetlands fluctuate due to seasonal variations in inputs. So that can be snow melt, variable precip uh, events, large storms are gonna bring the water level up. The snow melt, when it melts, it's gonna bring the water level up in the wetland. So when that water level comes up, that sulfate and mercury uh, is mixed into the water table. So that water table goes down, that sulfate and mercury is in an anaerobic environment. And in an anaerobic environment, that sulfate, uh, which is now in the groundwater, if you will, is available to bacteria. These are sulfate reducing bacteria. They respire just like we do, but instead of using oxygen in their respiration process, they're using sulfate. And when they reduce sulfate, to sulfide, there's a co-metabolic process that also methylates the mercury, and that's where the mobile form of mercury is generated, is, is through these sulfate-reducing bacteria. That methylmercury is now available to be mobilized in these wetland systems, where it can migrate out into adjacent uh, streams and things like that that flow into the uh, St. Louis River. This cycle goes on naturally uh, 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 every day, every year, seasonally, uh, due to these uh, variable inputs of uh, sulfate, mercury, uh, variable water levels in these wetlands that drives the uh, formation of this uh, compound. It's noted here that the water level fluctuations in these wetlands, uh, which there's been some debate on, are actually, uh, PolyMet's got data that shows that these water levels fluctuate by about 18 inches per year around, around the mine site. So we know that this process is naturally occurring and it'll continue to occur uh, uh, once uh, the project is in, in operation. So in summary, um, the analysis of potential effects on water quality, uh, notably mercury, methylmercury, sulfate, and specific conductance, as documented in the materials that PolyMet has provided to the PCA and the Corps of Engineers as part of the 401 water quality certification. The cross-media analysis, as it's been referred to, was a thoroughly quantitative and exhaustive uh, scope and evaluation to look specifically at the band's claims that their water quality standards would be violated. I've been working in this industry for about 30 years, seen a lot of this type of work on various types of projects. This was very exhaustive and it was very much on point directly to the questions that the bands have raised throughout the EIS and throughout the permitting process. The analysis, which is conservative, um, shows that the project will reduce loading of sulfate and mercury to the St. Louis River. There will be no violation of the band's water quality standards uh, for specific conductance, sulfate, or any other standard. There'll be a reduction in specific conductance in the St. Louis River. There'll be a reduction in salinity in the St. Louis River. There'll be no impact on sturgeon spawning and water level fluctuations in the wetlands will not alter the generation of methylmercury uh, as, as has been alleged uh, in prior um, presentations. So with that, I'll hand it over to the next speaker.
Hello, my name is Cliff Tworski, T-W-A-R-O-S-K-I. I'm an environmental scientist with Bar Engineering Company. I've been with Bar for almost 25 years. I, prior to that, I was with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency for a little over 15 years. And my thesis work was done on the Corona Bog, just to the west of the casino here, uh, looking at peatland reclamation. Um, today, I'd like to talk about points of with the project as far as the detailed modeling that shows we have a reduction of mercury and sulfate as well as methyl mercury. Unfortunately, I do need to talk about the ban not accounting for the project water management and treatment. It's an important part of the project and needs to be uh, accounted for. Um, we also have heard the band uh, and their um, concerns about flushing events. And so we have done a screening analysis to address that. And I'll talk more about that. But that screening analysis is indicating uh, that the project is still reducing sulfate, and, uh, mercury, and methylmercury loading, even under those high flushing events. Oh, sorry. OK. We heard a little bit about linkages yesterday, and I'd just like to refresh everybody's memory. Uh, for methylmercury, uh, that is linked to sulfate and mercury and the uh, anaerobic environments and wetlands and lake sediments. For the export of mercury and methylmercury from wetlands, that's linked to organic matter and water flow. Organic matter is a carrier of mercury and methylmercury. And as increasing flows occur, you will be increasing organic matter export. The DNR has documented that in their studies of the St. Louis River. And uh, we'll be talking a little bit more about that later. Fish uptake of methylmercury is linked to the formation of methylmercury, which is linked to the sulfate and mercury. And the export from wetlands to downstream waters is uh, uh, linked to the water flow. And the main point here is that if we affect one part or one parameter, we are going to be affecting other parameters as well. I'd like to talk a little bit more about the sulfate and methylmercury linkage, uh, with mercury being transformed uh, to methylmercury, again occurring primarily in wetlands and lake sediments. Uh, the methylation process does not so much occur in flowing waters where you have more oxygen occurring, and I would call that channel flow. Uh, methylmercury, once it's in the food chain, as uh, Dr. Brand Fearon pointed out yesterday, uh, there is biomagnification up the food chain. And that has resulted in a number of uh, fish consumption advisories, including for the St. Louis River. One of the other points I'd like to make about this sulfate and methylmercury is that the MPCA uh, did an analysis around a tailings basin. Uh, and they found that uh, if you increase sulfate load, you will be increasing methylmercury. The amount of sulfate increase is important, though. In this watershed, in the St. Louis River watershed, an increase in sulfate may not show an increase in methylmercury, and that is included in DNR studies as well as polymet studies. The MPCA has also concluded in their statewide mercury TMDL uh, that sulfate loading will uh, decrease in sulfate loading will decrease mercury in fish. US EPA approved that TMDL, and by, by that approval, uh, they, they also concur with that uh, finding. The, also, the US EPA in another report, I think in 2009, also identified that if you reduce sulfate loading, you are reducing methylmercury. We'd also like to talk a little bit about existing conditions. And we are talking about this to make sure that everybody has a proper understanding of how the project fits in to the existing conditions. This is sulfate. And sulfate, as you heard yesterday, there's sulfate coming from the mining watersheds, which are these dark gray watersheds on the top part of the St. Louis River watershed. And with the loading estimates, uh, the, the mining watersheds provide about 70% of the sulfate load in the St. Louis River. 
you can see that from the the proposed uh, project area, the former LTV tailings basin provides some sulfate as well. There's also sulfate provided by the future uh, mine site, even though it's not it's a natural site right now. Uh, there is sulfate loading that is occurring from that area. The other part of this slide is that there is sulfate coming from non-mining watersheds. And as the DNR has identified, uh, that is a significant loading to the lower St. Louis River. If you took away all the mining sulfate, you would still have a methylmercury problem in the lower St. Louis River. And during storm events, high flow events like, uh, like occurring now, the sulfate loading from the non-mining watersheds, in particular these large watersheds on the southern part of the, of the, of the St. Louis River watershed, can contribute as much sulfate as the mining watersheds. So that they, they are not insignificant. And we just wanna make sure that everybody understands that. For methylmercury and for mercury, uh, the contribution is primarily from the non-mining watersheds. And again, this is different than sulfate. Here are the non-mining watersheds particularly the Cloquet River watershed and the Whiteface uh, River watershed, are primary contributors of methylmercury loading to the lower St. Louis River. Both of these systems come in below the mining uh, district and the Whiteface comes in just north of the Fond du Lac Reservation and the Cloquet comes in within the Fond du Lac Reservation boundaries. I did not hear the band identify this type of loading to the lower St. Louis River yesterday, nor have I found any of this loading information in any of their documents that they've presented or, or prepared as part of the environmental review process or in the 404 uh, this proceeding. Uh, um, again, the non-mining areas are the major contributor. One of the reasons for the white face, uh, that watershed has about 31% of its area in wetlands and that is uh, contributing to its contribution. The Cloquet River watershed, though, only has about 13% of its watershed in wetlands. But the Cloquet also has a very high flow. It's a major contributor to flow in the lower St. Louis River. So even at moderate methylmercury concentrations, its higher flow produces a loading that is uh, just slightly less than the uh, Whiteface River. The one interesting point on this slide is that for the Partridge River, it's identified as a mining watershed, and it's standing out a little bit more than, say, the Embarrass River watershed or the Swan. Those are also mining watersheds. And for the Partridge, there is not much mining development in that watershed. It's, it has the North Shore uh, Peter Mitchell uh, pit dewatering water that is provided to the Partridge, but otherwise that watershed is fairly undisturbed. But one of the things about the Partridge is that uh, it has two major uh, subwatersheds within it, the south branch of the Partridge, as well as Colville Creek. And those two uh, tributaries to the Partridge uh, enter the main stem of the Partridge below the project area, but they are originate in wetlands. And uh, that uh, baseline data we have for the Partridge River indicates that they provide more loading to the Partridge River than does the upper part uh, where the mine proposed mine area is located. So again, uh, wetlands within the Partridge River are providing this methylmercury load. And the project will have no effect on 99 plus percent of the loading of methylmercury to the St. Louis River. They will, the project will address, uh, will be reducing loading from its area but overall, it will not have an effect on the majority of methylmercury showing up in the lower St. Louis River. Okay. Now let's talk about the project. And the project does have additions. Uh, we do have a, a wastewater treatment discharge. We have sulfate in that discharge at 10 milligrams per liter. We have mercury in that discharge at 1.3 nanograms per liter and it does add up to a load going out to those wetlands. And the band has focused on this part of the project. <clears throat> However, if you really want to look at the overall project 
and you need to look at the overall project, there is a lot of reductions in sulfate and mercury occurring with the project in operation. And when we look at, in particular, the headwater wetlands, which the band has identified as an important area of concern, the loading uh, of sulfate is reduced by some 265,000 kilograms per year. And if you multiply that number by 20, it gets up very high over the, over the life of the project. Uh, mercury is also reduced to those headwater wetlands, about two, na about two grams per year. And the other part that I'd like to emphasize is that with the wastewater treatment system discharge, that discharge needs to be within plus or minus 20% of existing conditions, average annual flow. And that is what is showing up on this slide. And so with the load reductions to the headwater wetlands due to the water capture and treatment, there is no increase in loading to those wetlands. Okay, I'd like to just talk about that water and water loading a little bit more because that seems to be an important part of the band's uh, comments. Um, again, the wastewater treatment discharge needs to be within plus or minus 20% of the average uh, annual average con existing conditions flow. Uh, the band claims that there will be excess flushing of these wetlands. That is not ex that can't happen if we're within plus or minus 20% of existing of, of existing conditions. In addition, the band has said that the flushing of the wetlands will increase organic matter export downstream. If we're not increasing flows, not going ex having excessive amounts of water uh, being released to those headwater wetlands, then we will not be flushing more organic matter that will carry more mercury and more methyl mercury downstream um, than what is already occurring. So again, we're staying within pretty much existing conditions with the wastewater treatment system discharge to those headwater wetlands and water loading is not an issue for this project. For the sulfate, uh, for project impacts, we looked at a number of evalu evaluation points around the project in the Embarrass River, the Partridge River watershed, as well as uh, locations in the St. Louis River and the uh, Partridge River, or uh, sorry, in the St. Louis River upstream of the Fond du Lac Reservation as well as downstream. For the plant site area in the Embarrass River, we found, again, for the headwater wetlands, that we will have reductions of sulfate, about 126,000 kilograms per year to the Trimble Creek headwater wetlands, about 139,000 kilograms per year to the unnamed Creek headwater wetlands. And by the time we get down to uh, PM13 in the Embarrass River itself, we have a reduction of about 1,280,000 kilograms per year. Then this is cumulative loading. This accounts for the project's air emissions of sulfur as well. And that includes sulfur emissions from, from stacks, mobile sources, as well as fugitive sulfide mineral dust. For the mine site, uh, we also see a reduction of sulfate, about 9,000 kilograms per year due to water capture and treatment. We also see a reduction at uh, discharge location SD026, which is the headwaters of Second Creek. That reduction is a little more than 84,000 kilograms per year. And again, that is wastewater discharge at about 10 milligrams per liter. We also see a reduction of about uh, 15,000 kilograms per year due to the uh, transfer of Kobe Lake water to the plant site for use as process water. And overall, when we look at the Partridge River, we have about 100,000 kilograms per year reduction. And again, this is taking into account the project's air emissions. In the Partridge River, most of those uh, air emissions are being driven by the sulfide mineral dust, and that's accounted for in these, uh, in these loading reductions. When we get to the St. Louis River, when we combine up the reductions uh, in the Embarrass River and the Partridge River, we're looking at a reduction of about of 1,380,000 kilograms per year. 
And again, when we look at a 20 year life, we're in that approximately 28 billion kilograms per year of sulfate reduction that's getting to the river. Forbes is above the Fond du Lac reservation. This loading reduction carries down to Cloquet and to the band's boundaries. Um, if we are reducing sulfate loading in the headwaters, we cannot be increasing sulfate loading downstream. If we're reducing sulfate loading around the plant site, mine site, that means we are also reducing methylmercury, both around in both of the Embarrass and Partridge River watersheds, as well as downstream at the Fond du Lac Reservation. For mercury, we also evaluated loading close to the project in the same locations as we did for sulfate and also in the St. Louis River. For that analysis, the numbers are smaller, but we are still showing a reduction of mercury loading to those headwater wetlands near the tailings basin, 1.5 gram per year reduction to Trimble Creek. Head, headwater wetlands, a small reduction, about 0 0.2 grams per year to the unnamed creek headwater wetlands. And when we get out to PM13 in the Embarrass River itself, the reduction is about 0 0.8 grams per year. And again, this includes the project's air emissions of mercury, which were modeled to uh, out to about 10 kilometers away from the project and uh, estimating deposition from those emissions. At the mine site, we see a reduction of about six grams per year. We also see a reduction when we uh, uh, transfer Colby Lake water over to the plant site. However, we also see an increase at SDO26 which again is the headwaters of the uh, Second Creek. That increase is due to uh, a small increase in water flow due to the wastewater treatment system. And it's also an increase based on our assumption that the mercury concentration of 0 0.5 nanograms per liter now goes up to 1.3 nanograms per liter with the wastewater treatment discharge. And that was a conservative, conservative assumption that we made for our impact calculations. However, as you've heard two previous speakers uh, uh, talk about, the Eagle Mine in Michigan has the same technology for water treatment being, as being proposed for the PolyMet project. The my understanding is there's at least three years of data that are showing uh, mercury concentrations in that discharge water of about 0 0.5 nanograms per liter or less. So the increase that we have identified here for SDO26 is likely an overestimate and that with the project in actual operation, uh, the, any increase in mercury is, like to be, is likely to be less than what we have calculated here. So when we look at the reduction of mercury loading in the Embarrass River of 0.8 grams per year, a reduction from the Partridge River watershed of 4.4 of grams per year, that totals to a little over five grams per year reduction at the, uh, Saint, in the St. Louis River at Forbes. And again, Forbes is upstream of the Fond du Lac Reservation. This reduction carries down to the Fond du Lac Reservation as well as to Cloquet. And, we, and because of the relationship of uh, mercury sulfate and methylmercury, if we're reducing mercury in the headwater regions, then we will be reducing methylmercury in the lower St. Louis River as well. So we've conducted a number of evaluations for the project. We've looked at the Embarrass River, the Partridge River, St. Louis River at Forbes and Cloquet. And all of those are identifying that there will be a decrease in sulfate and mercury loading and mer methylmercury loading to the, the watersheds uh, where the project is located as well as to the St. Louis River uh, at Forbes and Cloquet. The cross-media analysis was conducted to specifically address the band's concerns about sulfide mineral dust adding sulfate to uh, wetlands and that and the uh, methyl, methyl mercury formation within those wetlands due to this extra loading of dust. What you can see in this table is that on an overall basis, the loading of sulfate from the project is, is small and the same for mercury. And when we look at the historic loading, especially of sulfate, which has been much higher than it currently is, 
and we take into account that methylation has occurred at the higher background loading. It's occurring now under existing conditions, and this small potential increase from the project, our conclusion is that we are not changing the methylating environment of wetlands in and around the project. Um, but the band is still has concerns, and they are expressing concerns about flushing events. And so we took a look at those flushing events to see what it meant. And in particular, the methylmercury was of interest to us because, as it is to the band, as to what's happening when we have these flushing events. The one thing that we're doing here is that we are comparing a flushing event in existing, in existing conditions to a flushing event with the project in operation. All of our previous mass balance calculations and analysis have been on average conditions, and the band has seemed to take uh, those average conditions and compare them to flushing events. And under that kind of comparison, yes, there is an increase, the project would show an increase but we want to look at a fair comparison of the project in operation to a flushing event in existing conditions. So we uh, assimilated data for looking at maximum flows uh, from the project's water modeling data packages. We looked at mercury and methylmercury concentrations from the baseline data that's been collected for the project, as well as uh, supplemental information from the DNR studies and pollution control agency studies. For the Embarrassed River and Partridge River watersheds in particular, we we're using a baseline data, but there is some DNR data for both of those watersheds. For the St. Louis River at Forbes and Cloquet, that data is primarily coming from DNR reports, USGS flow information, as well as the Pollution Control Agency and some of their data. And again, the project and operation does reflect water capture and treatment. And that again is a primary part of the project that needs to be incorporated into all of these uh, uh, understandings of what this project means. So when we look at the project um, in a high flushing condition, uh, we can see that uh, there is still a reduction occurring even under these flow conditions, again, because of the water treatment and water capture occurring due to the project. The other part of this information is that this net change, this reduction due to the project, carries down to Forbes. But also, we also see a very high uh, contribution from non-project areas. And as you rec recall some of the slides uh, presented by Steve Donahue, there is a significant amount of mercury that's being deposited to the, to the St. Louis River watershed as a whole. And that's being reflected in these non-mining area contributions, non-project area contributions as being much more significant than what's coming out of the project area in existing conditions. And that's the same whether you're at Forbes or whether you're at uh, Cloquet. And again, we have the Whiteface River and Cloquet River coming in, uh, in this lower part of the river, and they are major contributors to this non-project area loading. With the project in operation, there is, a again, a reduction in mercury loading and that is, uh, again, carried through to Forbes, and it's also carried down river to Cloquet. For methylmercury, we have the same story, that the project uh, does reduce loading of methylmercury under these high flow scenarios. Again, uh, that loading is uh, occurring at Forbes up above Fond du Lac. It's also occurring downstream at Cloquet. And again, we have a large contribution from the non-mining, non-project areas, and only a small contribution from the project area itself, whether it's in existing conditions or in operation. And again, the overall conclusion here is that we have, under this worst case scenario, where, where and this incorporates all the severe flushing, uh, severe water level uh, declines, uh, that the band has talked about, this incorporates all of that and still we show a reduction in both mercury and methylmercury under this high flushing scenario. So in summary, our modeling work and the support analyses that we've conducted uh, identify a decrease in sulfate, mercury, and methylmercury loading in the St. Louis River. The band 
does not seem to account for this water management and treatment. The direct discharges from the project will not increase loading of water, organic matter, sulfate, mercury, or methylmercury. Uh, the wastewater treatment discharge to headwater wetlands will be similar to existing conditions flow. So there's no, again, no excess water loading, no excess flushing of organic matter. If we are reducing loading in the headwaters region, we will not be increasing loading in downstream areas. And even under a high flushing uh, scenario, the project is still uh, reducing loading. And again, if we're reducing sulfate in the headwaters region, we are reducing methylmercury in the downstream waters. And so that's the end of my presentation. Good morning. Uh, my name is Greg Council. That's spelled C-O-U-N-C-I-L. I am an environmental engineer with Tetra Tech. Um, my background is I have about 28 years of experience focused on groundwater hydrology, uh, groundwater modeling, and the interaction of groundwater and surface water and modeling of that process, those processes. My work on the project to date primarily has been peer review type work uh, in the modeling area. Uh, today I'm gonna discuss uh, the claims that were made by the band related primarily to groundwater drawdown and how such a groundwater drawdown <clears throat> might affect water quality in downstream waters. Um, the, the, the items I'll be talking about, the analyses, are documented in a memo that we provided uh, to the Corps. As Ms. Schultz did yesterday, I'd like to start with a, a map of the watershed just to orient ourselves. Um, you've seen this map before. I'll point out that for the purpose of the presentation today, we're gonna focus right here just on the mine site where drawdown from development of mine pits uh, would, would occur because of the groundwater that would flow into those pits. So focusing now, just on that area, let's look at these features around the, in the mine site. Uh, this particular figure shows the Partridge River flowing around the mine site. Uh, this is the, uh, it flows on the north side, the east side, and then the south of where the mine pits would be. Those mine pits are outlined here in black, the west pit and the combined central and east pit. Um, not developed yet, but if the mine is permitted, these pits would then uh, be excavated and water, groundwater would flow into them. Shaded in green here are the extensive wetlands throughout this watershed. We've talked a lot about the wetlands in the, in the mine site area, and we're going to talk a little bit about them over the next few minutes. Um, I'll just point out that, yes, there, there are extensive wet, wetlands in this area. It covers a lot of this map. Um, I'll also point out that up in the upper left-hand corner, you see a portion of the Peter Mitchell mine, an active existing uh, iron mine that's somewhat near the proposed mine site. So the, I wanna point out, just make sure that we're all clear and we all agree, I believe, that these, these wetlands do now produce sulfate, uh, mercury, methylmercury. Uh, these are constituents that are currently stored in the peats of these wetland sediments and can be released uh, when the when this sulfur is oxidized and then that sulfur promotes methylmercury creation from the mercury through the sulfate reducing bacteria. This is happening now. It's happening in this watershed and all throughout the St. Louis River watershed as Cliff Tworski pointed out earlier. So we're going to talk a little bit about the claim that there would be a massive drawdown here as a result of development of these pits and that that massive drawdown, according to the, to the band, would lead to drastically more sulfate oxidation. And that sulfate oxidation uh, in the sediments would lead to methylmercury creation that would then be transported 
to the Partridge River and then downstream to the St. Louis River. That's, we're, we're going to talk about that um, and try to at least give some sense of the quantities involved here. Uh, there's really not a quantification of those processes in the band's claim, but we'll try to at least provide some bounding calculations uh, in, in this uh, discussion. So to overview the band's claims here related to drawdown, the band, uh, and, and, and also a little bit of my summary uh, that, that is detailed somewhat more in the memo. Uh, basically, we're going to show in some of these subsequent slides that the band is really not accounting for the fact that wetlands in this area will actually be directly removed. And while that will have to be mitigated and is in fact being mitigated, uh, the reduction, the removal of those wetlands actually removes the, the sulfate generating portion of those wetlands. The uh, band's analysis overstates the amount of drawdown that would occur. We'll get into that a little bit. And through that overstatement basically implies that you're going to get a net increase of sulfate, mercury, methylmercury rep reporting to the Partridge River into downstream waters. We'll go through those claims and show you why that is not the case. Um, additionally, the band's claims that uh, mod flow should have been used to predict uh, what the impacts would be in wetlands. Um, we're going to talk about that on one slide just to show that that's really not what mod flow is intended for. And then lastly, uh, we'll talk about some mitigating factors, some hydrogeochemical mitigating factors that uh, influence what actually happens with the sulfate and the metal methylmercury uh, so that um, we get a little bit better handle on what's really going on in the system. Back to this figure. Again, this is just an overview figure showing the area around the mine site. I'll superimpose on that. The, the acreage of wetlands that would be removed basically filled and excavated as a, as a product of building these mines and, and the stockpiles. These wetlands now, once the project would go into effect, uh, have no, no longer generate sulfate or methylmercury. Going one step further, this figure shows some of the wetlands that would be potentially impacted by drawdown. Now, this is from the analysis in the FEIS. So this analysis is based on the analog uh, method, which uses the data from a nearby mine to estimate how much drawdown would occur in and around the mine. Um, we all agree that drawdown would be greater near the mine, near the mine pits, and that it would be decreased as you move away. Uh, this one, this particular rendition shows drawdown or shows in, in orange, I should say, uh, the areas that are in the FEIS predicted to be highly likely affected by drawdown or moderately likely uh, affected by drawdown. Uh, the FEIS also points out some wetlands that are low likelihood drawdown wetlands. But this, this acreage, high and moderate, is about 160 acres, a little bit more than 160 acres. Again, it's based on the analog method from the nearby Canistillo mine. Uh, it's conservative in one way in that the Canistillo mine is, is actually developed into the Bawabic formation, which is a permeable relative to the relative to the Duluth complex and the Virginia formation where these mine pits, where the polymet mine pits would be developed. The Canistillo mine's in a much more permeable unit. So if we look at these orange shaded wetlands that potentially affected by drawdown, the, the, the obviously obvious question is what if the high, what if these drawdowns were affected by drawdown in a way that increased the oxidation, therefore increasing sulfate and increasing methylmercury production? So as I said, you've got about, I may not have mentioned the acreage, you've got about 750 acres taken away as methylmercury producing uh, acreage of wetlands. So those now produce sulfate, methylmercury, would be taken away from this system, producing sulfate methylmercury. And you've still got, maybe you've got 160 or so acres that have an additional oxidation capacity because there's drawdown that creates a little bit drier wetland. Well, in order to make up just for the 750 that you've removed, you'd have to more than quintuple the amount of sulfate creation from those 161 acres that have been increased in oxidation. Nowhere do, do, do any of the data or any of the scientific studies suggest that this type of increase is likely. 
Um, one of the studies I believe that Dr. Renfuren pointed out yesterday showed 190% increase in methylmercury, but again, not quintupling of that amount. It's important. You can't ignore the loss in load due to the removal of wetlands and the capture of the water. The net effect here is a reduction in methylmercury creation. Now, what if the area of impact is much larger as the, if, as the band is claimed? This figure, I've zoomed out a little bit so that we can show the, entire, the entirety of what, uh, approximately at least, is what the, uh, the Glyphwick analysis, the band's analysis, is, has alleged it would be the actual affected acreage uh, based on their alternative analyses. So this shows in blue, combined with the previously shaded orange and black areas, about 6,000, actually a little bit less, but roughly 6,000 acres um, that are within 10,000 feet of the proposed polymet pits. So I, I wanted to look at this 6,000 acres and say, well, if, if the drawdown is massive enough to create this, this big of a drawdown, this, big, this much wetland impact, how much would the wetland impact be on average? Or how much, you know, what, how could I get a bounding calculation to see what additional loads of sulfate and methylmercury would actually be generated from this much wetland impact. And here, I think it's important first to just sort of, first of all, we just developed a little illustration to show how big the 6,000 acres is compared to what's being removed and what we really think would be affected by drawdown. So this shows, just as a simple illustration, again in blue, uh, just an, just an area that's 6,000 acres if every square on this figure is, is assumed to be one acre. We'll compare to that the amount of wetlands that would be directly affected, basically removed through filling or excavation. That's about 750 acres. And we'll also show the area that the FEIS shows would be highly or moderately likely to be impacted by drawdown, a much smaller 161 acres. But if it was, if drawdown actually affected the entirety of the 6,000 acres, how severe would that impact be? For this, it's important to look at how much groundwater is actually going to be flowing into the pit. We have estimates of this from the detailed modeling, the ModFlow modeling that was developed for the project. And ModFlow, by the way, a groundwater model is a good tool for estimating groundwater inflow to a mine pit. So this figure shows on the x-axis, the year of operation of the mine. And the y-axis shows the estimated, the modeled inflow to the groundwater pits from groundwater. Each pit, the central pit, the east pit, and the west pit are shown on different lines, different colors, with the black line being the total groundwater inflow to the entire mine. It averages over time, if you just take a, a, a simple time average over this entire 20-year mine life, the average inflow is about 502, uh, 502 rather, gallons per minute, uh, roughly 1.1 CFS. Just for context, um, I think Christy Kearney pointed out earlier that the, the flow in the Partridge River just downstream of the mine is about 49 CFS on average, so we're talking 2 to 3 percent of the total flow is groundwater flow coming into the mine. Where is this groundwater flow coming from? Well, it's not all coming from wetlands, wetlands, but it could be some of it could be coming from wetlands. A lot of it's coming from groundwater storage because as you draw down the water table, you're pulling water that had previously been stored in the pores, in the unsaturated, in the uh, unconsolidated system, and you're you're pulling in water that was previously in fractures. You're also pour, perhaps pulling in water that would have been evapotranspirated in, in uplands, and you are pulling in water that would have reported instead to wetlands, or maybe even more that seeps out of wetlands. So let's assume that a lot of this water, maybe even all of this 500 gallons a minute, uh, was pulled from these 6,000 acres of wetlands. What would that really mean? So if we take the band's assertion that 6,000 acres would be affected, on average, pulling out 500 gallons a minute out of 6,000 acres of wetland results in a 0 0.083 gallons per minute per acre removal out of that, out of those, out of those wetlands. Now we've made some assumptions here, conservative for the most part in that we've taken the entirety 
of the predicted groundwater inflow and assumed it's all taken from the water budgets from these 6,000 acres of wetlands that around the mine within 10,000 feet of the mine. So with that average effect, we're pulling out basically 1.6 inches per year out of the water budget of the wetlands around the mine in this particular analysis. That 1.6 inches per year is about 5% of the average precipitation in this area of Minnesota. Average precipitation being around 30 inches per year. So we're pulling out perhaps 5% of the water budget of these wetlands through development of the mine, pulling groundwater into the mine instead of going to these wetlands. We basically, in a way, made the wetlands 5% drier. If we take that, what that 5% drier wetland really means, it's effectively like having the original 6,000 acres and adding another 5%. So you've got 6,000 acres that are already now producing sulfate through these processes, natural variation in water levels going up and down. You get sulfate creation, you get methylmercury creation. If you think about a 5% drier case, it's effectively like adding 300 acres back in. That's 5% of 6,000. You still haven't accounted for the removal. You still haven't made up for, rather, the removal of the 750 acres uh, through the original direct removal of wetlands. So you still, in this analysis, have a net loss of sulfate, methylmercury, and mercury reporting to the pore waters and the wetland sediments. Let's talk for a second about mod flow. As I mentioned, mod flow, very good tool for, you, for estimating what's going on in groundwater. Um, in this case, we've used, ground, we've used mod flow to calculate mine inflow. That's, good, that's a good use. There is uh, many limitations with using mod flow to predict what's happening in wetlands. It really doesn't have uh, the capability of simulating wetlands in any detail. And that's important because wetlands are complex they're very variable on a spatial scale and on a temporal scale. There are natural fluctuations in the way that wetlands behave that go on now, and these are hard to capture, especially with models that have a, have a large grid cell size and typically have a long time step. Importantly, wetlands have low permeability peat sediments in many cases, and those, um, without doing a lot of layering and a lot of detail, real, real fine tuning, it, it's just really, really difficult to get that right. Even if, you, even if you were to use something uh, like a numerical simulator to try to predict that. Um, there, there are other wetland processes going on. They're basically um, impossible to use, uh, to, impossible to model with ModFlow. So while it's a useful tool, the important limitations uh, for ModFlow with regard to wetlands make it uh, really not usable for predicting directly what's happening in wetlands. Some of the complications actually also come into play when you think about how the sulfate and mercury in wetland sediments may mobilize down gradient. For this, I want to turn a little bit to just a brief overview of the hydrogeochemical conditions that have to occur for, for, the, for the sulfate to oxidize and to create methylmercury. I won't go into this in detail because we've covered it. We covered it yesterday with Dr. Brent Furin, covered it today on a couple of previous presentations, presentations, just to say that we all know it's happening that naturally this happens, and that yes, in certain circumstances, it could be exacerbated um, by, by drawdown. But there are at least four mitigating factors that we're gonna go into to, that describe why, you take a little bit bigger picture, you take a step back, any sulfate, methylmercury, mercury that's created in the pores of the wetland sediments, instead of reporting down to the Partridge River and downstream waters is actually going to report to the mine or otherwise not, have, not go downstream and would eventually be pumped over to the plant site where it would be eventually treated uh, by the reverse osmosis by the membrane treatment system that we discussed earlier. So in the bigger picture, this cross-section is just a conceptual cross-section. This cross-section shows a little bit of the processes that actually happen once a mine pit is developed and water begins to draw down near it. So in much of the area around the mine, what you have is a decreased water table and water that would have flowed via runoff out to the Partridge River would have potentially flowed via shallow groundwater flow. Maybe during high storm events, the groundwater would have discharged to the surface and then through runoff. 
a lot of that water that now is going to report to the mine pit instead. Again, it just gets captured, eventually treated. Uh, you get less runoff. You get less flow of groundwater, lower gradient. I'll talk about basically less driving force of groundwater toward the Partridge River. And you actually get some mobilization of mercury downward into the soil column, which tends to sequester it to some degree. So effectively, these processes are mitigating in that they limit the downstream, the, the down gradient movement of the sulfate and methyl mercury to downstream waters. As I said, there are at least four processes here that we'll just briefly touch on. Uh, these processes mitigate the transport of the sulfate and mercury to downstream waters. The first one is you've reduced now through the development of the mine, the hydraulic gradient that naturally goes from the mine site area, the upland mine site area, down toward the Partridge River. You've reduced that hydraulic gradient and you've therefore reduced the driving force that would push groundwater toward the Partridge River. This results in a lower load of water, of, of sulfate and other constituents to the Partridge River. In fact, nearest, nearest the mine where the drawdown, where the increased oxidation is alleged to occur, nearest the mine, that is where you're more likely to have the water flowing toward the mine, where it would eventually get captured. Second mitigating factor. As I mentioned, you've pulled now the water table down so that during high flow events, like the, the large snow melt event, like really what's going on now with the high flows in the rivers, uh, during these high runoff events, you're less likely to have wetland pour water discharging up into, up into runoff and making it to the Partridge River and then to downstream waters. So during these high events, you're going to have greater infiltration, a greater balance of more infiltration and less discharge. And you're going to have less runoff, less sulfate and methyl mercury making it to the rivers. Thirdly, Mitigating factors. There will be some vertical redistribution of methyl mercury downward into the soil column. Some of the experiments show that, uh, and these are some of the experiments I think that Dr. Brenfuren was talking about yesterday. They show that actually the process moves, the process of the cycling that was illustrated well, I think in Steve Donahue's animations earlier, that process tends to move the mercury down in the sediment column uh, during the process once there is some drawdown in the, underneath. This graph shows, I think it's, this is pulled directly from one of those, uh, it's, it's put noted here, directly from one of those papers. It shows the mercury concentrations in soil, in sediments of the wetland rather, uh, measured as a function of depth. So we have concentration on the x-axis up here and we have depth on the y-axis. In the high water table, or base case, let's say, uh, the water table is varying between 7 and 11 centimeters below land surface. And in this case, you've got your peak mercury concentrations occurring at about 20 to 35 centimeters below land surface. Once the low water table is established in this same sediment column, what happens is you get the higher mercury concentrations, similar levels, but much lower in the, cell, in, the, in the soil column down to uh, 30 to even 60 centimeters deep. So you got less, less mercury in the more available, shallower portion of the soil column and, and more mercury down deeper. You've effectively sequestered some of the mercury into a deeper, into a deeper portion of the so, a sediment column. Finally, Demethylation. Um, there, well, we all agree that the methylation of mercury is an important, important process. It's important to also consider that demethylation occurs. So it's a, it's a reversible process and it can occur where the actual um, mercury that's created, rather than making it downstream to the Partridge River, it could be, uh, by, the same, by the same basic processes, could be demethylated. And in fact, one of the studies that I believe Dr. Brinfuren talked about yesterday talks about this demethyl demethylization and about how important it is in that it prevents what you might expect otherwise um, to see in the downstream waters.
So in summary, we find that the bands will affect analysis related to drawdown and its creation of mercury, uh, methylmercury rather, sulfate in downstream waters is overstated. Not only because it overpredicts the drawdown in wetlands relative to what the FEIS describes, it also implies that, they ox that the oxidation in those sediments in, these huge, in this larger area of wetlands uh, would overwhelm the other impacts that we've talked about before that tend to reduce the loads of sulfate, mercury, and methylmercury to downstream waters. It's important to not only assess what might happen due to drawdown uh, to increase oxidation, but also the important mitigating factors that I described that would tend to pull any increased sulfate and any existing sulfate and mercury and methylmercury into the mine where it would be treated before discharge. So as part of the project, not only do we expect the sulfate and mercury and methylmercury to decrease rather than increase as a result of all the development, we're also going to institute a thorough monitoring plan and adaptive management to ensure that that's the case. We're going to be monitoring the impact on wetlands. The project will adapt the project as needed to ensure that water quality is preserved. This is not waiting or planning for bad things to happen. Uh, the analysis shows that the loads are going to decrease. But we're going to be monitoring so that if something we don't expect does occur, we get an early warning, and we can use our, our known mitigating actions to ensure that a negative environmental consequence does not occur, such as a water quality violation. These monitoring ideas and adaptive management will be discussed now as Christy Kearney comes up for our last portion of the presentation. Christy? Thank you. Um, I'd like to take a moment. Uh, my name is Christy Kearney. Kearney is K-E-A-R-N-E-Y. Um, I'm going to take a moment to step us back for a moment. Um. So it was recognized in um, watching our presentation uh, we have, an, we have a typo in our presentation. Um, I've talked about um, these numbers on the slide are correct overall, with the exception of this sulfate total for the 20 year total. Um, that number should be 27.6 million kilograms. Still a huge number, but it's not billion. So our ex experts today have explained in great detail the science behind our an analysis. It's the details that matter, which the band has left out of their will effect letter or mischaracterized in their presentations yesterday. The understanding of these details is what led the agencies to the issuance of our permits. However, the agencies didn't just rely on the science and our modeling. I'm now going to talk through the monitoring required by our, our environmental permits, the annual analyses and verification evaluations that we're required to do, and the adaptive management and mitigation laid out in our permits. This slide shows our extensive, comprehensive water and wetland monitoring required as a result of our North Met permits. This compilation of monitoring required is from our two NPDES permits, our consent decree, our 401 water quality certification, our 404 permit, our Wetland Conservation Act decision, and our permit to mine. This includes, get this back up, stream water quality, stream flow, groundwater quality and groundwater levels, wetland hydrology, wetland vegetation, wetland water quality, industrial water collection, treated water discharge, and macroinvertebrate and fish monitoring that were required to do. 280 monitoring locations in total. 
Many of these have been underway throughout the environmental review process, but there's a number of these that are new monitoring locations that have started once our permits were issued. For example, we have 16 years of wetland hydrology data. This creates a robust data set to evaluate potential project impacts from baseline conditions. We're not aware of any other mine that has a monitoring program as robust as this. Now let's focus in on the mercury monitoring, so that's, since that's what's most important in the presentations yesterday and today. We are and will be monitoring mercury at 66 different locations around our project site, in stream water quality, in wetland water quality, in industrial water collection, and in our treated water discharge. The MPCA required monitoring to confirm the expected outcomes of our cross-media work and to ensure the ability to perform adaptive management if changes were found that were attributable to the project. This mercury monitoring is compiled from our two NPDS permits, our 401 water quality certification, and our permit to mine. The band has contended that there's not enough monitoring to detect harm. This slide and the prior slide showing our 280 monitoring locations shows that that claim is incorrect. In addition to monitoring, the agencies also required also included numerous permit conditions that require annual review of our monitoring results. Many of these analyses are listed on this slide. We're required to perform an annual potential indirect wetland impact assessment to evaluate wetland water levels and vegetation. This is from our 404 permit, our 401 water quality certification, and our Wetland Conservation Act decision. We're required to do an annual evaluation of stream and wetland of interest water quality monitoring data to evaluate against our baseline conditions and our cross-media analysis results and predictions based on our 401 water quality certification conditions. We're required to do an annual groundwater evaluation to assess monitoring results, the suitability of our monitoring network, spatial distribution of our groundwater quality, and potential for north flow at the mine site, according to our NPDES permit conditions. Our NPDES conditions also require us to do an annual comprehensive performance evaluation to assess the performance of our engineering controls and our monitoring network. And we also have many other um, annual reviews that we're required to do for our permit to mine and our water appropriation permit that I won't get into today. Additionally, once our monitoring results have been analyzed, we're also required by permit conditions to perform an annual verification, modeling, and evaluation. In this annual assessment, we'll be assessing the predictions of our water quality and quantity and comparing them to the actual observed monitoring data. We'll be verifying previously predicted long-term impacts from our EIS and permitting by rerunning our water models with the actual observed data from the monitoring. We're required to determine if changes are needed to re remedy unacceptable impacts that might be recognized in, those, um, in the rerunning of our water models or in the monitoring data itself and implement our adaptive management and contingency mitigations that we've already laid out. And every five years, we're required to reevaluate, rerun our underlying conceptual models, such as our mod flow model. This is required by our permit to mine, our NPDES permit, and our water appropriation permits. Now let's talk about adaptive management and mitigation because it doesn't appear that that was well understood by the band based on the, the discussion yesterday. Polymet has proposed an adaptive management approach. Adaptive engineering controls can, can change as a result of monitoring or monitoring data or modeling data. Our water treatment plant is an example of an engineering control. It's designed to be modular, so if we're seeing higher flows or higher loads, we can add additional units to it um, to be able to expand the engineering control and make sure that we're meeting our permit conditions and our requirements. Additionally, contingency mitigations have already been laid out in our permitting documents and could be enacted if, if required. Every one of our major permits includes adaptive management processes and mitigation measures to evaluate and consider. For example, the 404 permit 
states that when changes are recognized, monitoring report shall include recommendations for appropriate steps to respond to the documented changes to include additional monitoring, adaptive management, and or compensatory mitigation. Note that it says when changes are recognized, not when permit violations are made. So this is required in addition to our 404 permit by our 401 certification, our NPDES permit, our permit to mine, our Wetland Conservation Act decision, and our water appropriation permit. So to wrap up, our project will not affect the quality of the band's waters so as to violate any of the band's water quality re requirements. In summary, our project will reduce sulfate and mercury loading and specific conductance in the St. Louis River. This statement was true from the EIS, as well as the additional analyses completed for permitting. The band needs to show that both the EIS and the permitting documents were wrong, 15 years worth of analyses to show a violation of their water quality standards. They have not so far. Speculation is not enough to show a violation of a water quality standard. There are adequate controls in place, both in project design and as permit requirements, to ensure that the project will not cause or contribute to a violation of water quality standards for sulfate, mercury, methylmercury, or specific conductance, or any other water quality standard at the Fond du Lac Reservation in the lower St. Louis River, 116 river miles away. The agencies didn't just rely on the science or our modeling that they reviewed and approved. They put into effect, we have over 7,000 permit conditions that we need to comply with, including comprehensive monitoring, annual verification modeling and evaluation, adaptive management, and contingency and required mitigations. Our project reuses existing infrastructure, bringing the site up to modern standards and cleaning up legacy issues in the process, including cleaning up the Embarrass River, the Partridge River, and the St. Louis River as a result of past mining disturbances that have occurred on our site. Currently, we're the only discharge in Minnesota that's required to meet the wild rice standard at the end of our pipe, which will result in a significant reduction in sulfate in the St. Louis River. This project is for the betterment of these streams, including the betterment of the St. Louis River and water quality at the Bands Reservation. Regardless, 116 river miles downstream is a long way, as I mentioned earlier. And although the Embarrass River and the Partridge River will clearly show this cleanup, it'll, it'll be mostly undetected in the St. Louis River at Forbes and at Fond du Lac because our flow is less than 1% of the flow at the Fond du Lac Reservation. Polymet will produce metals that are essential for the U.S. sustainability and energy goals and will be one of the only sources of nickel and cobalt which are essential to battery storage. Our project has gone through extensive joint state and federal environmental review and permitting processes with unprecedented community and, and tribal involvement. Fond du Lac and the EPA were both cooperating agencies for the, for the supplemental EIS and for the final EIS. And what wasn't mentioned yesterday was that although we did get a failing grade on an earlier version of our EIS, our draft EIS, we went back to the drawing board. We did a supplemental EIS completely changing our project, including adding the requirement for the 10 milligram per liter sulfate standard. And as a result, the EPA gave our supplemental draft EIS an EC2 rating, which is the highest rating a mining company has ever gotten in the US. And lastly, our project meets the definition of responsible domestic mining called for in the Presidential Decree on the Defense Production Act. I thank you for allowing us the opportunity to present the full story on our project. Thank you, Christy, and thank you to, to you, Steve, Cliff, and Greg for your presentations. 
Greg, I'll make a note that our YouTube recording um, cut out at the uh, period of your summary slide. However, we have a backup recording and a backup to the backup recording and a transcript. Uh, so we'll ensure to capture uh, that portion. So now we'll take our recess until 1230. Um, 